Welcome everyone. I'm Jonathan Tepperman, the Editor-in-Chief of The Catalyst here at the Bush Institute. Thank you so much for joining us for this webinar. This is an Engage event presented by NextPoint. So we're holding today's discussion to celebrate the release of the fall issue of The Catalyst, which you can find and subscribe to at bushcenter.org forward slash catalyst. Since we first launched the journal back in January 2016, we've tended to organize each of our issues around a single theme. But this time, for this issue, we decided to try something a little different. Instead of focusing all of our essays on a specific topic, we thought we'd experiment with featuring a type of article instead. It's a format that I call The Fix, Essays that describe how one government or one organization or one institution somewhere on the planet has solved or at least made great progress dealing with a problem that the rest of us are still struggling with. Now, I had a few reasons for trying this path. First, I figured that doing so would let us showcase the huge variety of issues that my colleagues at the Bush Institute work on every day. Second, by emphasizing fixes, it allowed us to underscore the fact that we here at the Bush Institute are not buying into the pessimism that surrounds all of us these days and that overwhelms us in the media. Despite all the bad news, we at the Catalyst in the Institute like to focus on solutions and on telling the stories of other hardworking folks around the world that are breaking new ground and actually getting stuff done. So on that note, I'm very lucky to have two of those hardworking folks here with me today. Ann Wicks is the Ann Kimball Johnson Director of Education and Opportunity here at the Bush Institute. And my friend Albert Torres is an associate in the Freedom and Democracy Program also here at the Institute. I want to start with some questions, and then I'm going to open it up to questions from all of you who are joining us online. My first question for both of you it involves the what. So you both wrote articles for the new issue, Taking on Big Problems. I want you to first start by just describing the specific problem that you decided to tackle. And then we'll get into the why and um, start to, to drill down on the topics in a minute. But just for now, What's the big problem? Anne and then Albert. Sure. Well, thanks, Jonathan. It's fun to be here to chat about this. And I'm excited because I think Albert's article, too, is really, uh, was really interesting. So um, I'm glad we'll get a chance to discuss this. So I wrote about a reading revolution, I think our headline was, that's happened in Mississippi. So the what of the problem there has been um, for decades, Mississippi has languished at the bottom of the list when we look at the National Assessment of Education Progress, which is a test we give to students all around the country. They have always ranked 49th or 50th in reading performance on the low end. We've, they've had huge gaps, we know, um, around uh, race and poverty-based gaps in terms of student performance in Mississippi and had really, really struggled to meaningfully serve uh, many of the kids in Mississippi and help them learn to read. And we know that reading, of course, is when you, when you can read, you can access all sorts of information as you move through your academic career. We often say children are learning to read from grades kinder through third grade, and then from fourth grade on, they're reading to learn, meaning they, they have to be able to read to learn science, social studies, advanced math, get into literature, all those things. So if you are, are not able to read by the time you're in third grade, you're typically gonna struggle very much um, as a student and that struggle will often follow you into adulthood. So as you point out, Mississippi was a, a, a particular laggard when it came to reading um, uh, literacy education, but it was by no means the only state with that problem. And as you also yeah. point out in the article, only 35% of fourth graders across the United States can read at grade level. This is one of the richest countries in the world. Our education system in many ways is widely envied. So why do we have this epidemic of illiteracy in the United States? Right, and we know, research tells us, about 95% of kids will learn to read. They will really learn to read. So how do we explain right. that incredible delta that you just explained? Um, for decades, we've had research that really helps us understand how children le learn to read. So that combines 
um, research and education, but also cognitive research, what we understand about brain science. And we know there are five elements typically to how children learn to read. Unfortunately, one of the most popular approaches to teaching reading in this country uh, does not reflect that research. So many, many kids in this country receive reading instruction that's something often called balanced literacy, some element of balanced literacy. Its predecessor was called whole language that was less about explicit instruction of how English language works, the rules, the sounds of our letters, how they combine, like a CH combines ch, that sound, or ST, we know what those sounds make, how that helps build words. And we don't teach kids often those explicit skills that they need to then build their comprehension, to build their fluency, their vocabulary over time. And Mississippi's success is they said enough, we know what research says. What does it look like if we really adopt this approach in a full-throated way in our state? So in other words, a, a well-intentioned but wildly misguided educational policy has resulted in the devastation of, of literacy programs across the country. That's, that's amazing. Um, Albert, let's talk to an, about another devastating um, problem. What did you choose to focus on in your piece? Yeah, so the issue that I decided to speak on, and I'll speak on it broadly before applying it to the context of the U.S. because I think it'll help to have that background information mm -hmm. when applying it. Basically, I take a look at how financially linked the global economy is. And specifically within that realm, what I talk about is the role of corporate secrecy. So how different jurisdictions have different interpretations of corporate law and also have different requirements on what is necessary to open up a company within that country and different benefits that they offer. Okay. And typically when you're within this specific process, you employ the services of these professions that have a unique set of expertise that are able to take advantage of loopholes and vulnerabilities that are existing because of those different interpretations. Okay. So now what we're starting to see is now we're starting to see several different countries that are suffering from two different characteristics or from two different issues. One, we're starting to see criminals and corrupt individuals alike starting to open up companies with the help of these professions that have the ability to take advantage of these existing loopholes in order to create these companies that now have layers of secrecy embedded within mm -hmm. them. Now, because of that, we have the second issue, which is a consequence of the first characteristic, and that's the fact that now we're starting to see more and more companies created with these layers of secrecy embedded within them, and what is happening is now we have criminals and corrupt individuals able to take advantage of these loopholes with the help of these professions to create these corporations that are so secretive that we don't understand who the beneficial owner is. Now, when I say so, like Anne just described, you have a neutral or perhaps even well-intentioned policy that's had this terrible unintended effect. Is that right? Right. Correct. Uh -huh. Correct. And because of it, now we're having a very difficult time understanding who the beneficial owners are. And when I say beneficial owner, what I'm referring to are individuals that are financially benefiting from the revenue that a company generates. Now, that's the issue broadly. However, when we apply that to the U.S., it's a bit interesting. An advocacy group known as the Tax Justice Network, they performed an index where they took a look at different financial secrecy and havens across the globe. And what they found was that the United States itself is the most complicit when it comes to harboring dirty money. And I think it's because of those two characteristics, but the United States is a bit of a unique situation. Well, let me stop you right there and, and ask you about that. So you start your piece by acknowledging that um, the Biden administration has made a huge commitment to fighting corruption overseas, right? It's not like they're blind to the issue, just the opposite. They've made it one of the hallmarks of their foreign policy. And the United States, for all of its faults, is a country of strong laws. I mean, that's one of the reasons it's so attractive as a destination for foreign investment, right? Because we have courts that um, will rule in predictable ways. We have um, laws on property, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's a reliable, jurisdiction. So as a consequence, the United States is not the first place one thinks about when people talk about graft or bribery or kleptocracy or theft of government resources. It's the last place that people talk about. So why did you choose to focus on corruption in the United States? Because it's a very attractive destination. And even though, yes, the federal government has acknowledged that this is a specific issue, the fact that we have a highly federated system means that within the United States, we have 50 different jurisdictions, mm -hmm. which means we have 50 different sets of polities that all interpret this specific issue differently in terms of corporate law and these different professions that assist them. So because of that, now we have a divide in terms of the federal government approach and these states that are financially benefiting from this activity. So now because of that, criminals and corrupt individuals are able to take advantage of that division between the states and these professions as well as the federal government in order to basically use the United States as its repository to hide dirty money. 
I see. So if I'm a bad guy, yeah. I pick the state that will let me be as secretive as possible Correct. to set up like a trust or a company yeah. or whatever, and you would never know Correct. I'm the bad guy. Yeah. Hmm. Fascinating. Fascinating. Okay. I was a villain. Yeah. You can see that Anne is making plans. <laughs> um, so those are the problems which you've outlined very well. Um, but the real thrust of your piece is on success stories, um, uh, uh, political jurisdictions that made enormous progress dealing with these problems that you've just outlined. Um, tell us, how did you stumble across the specific stories you decided to tell um, to feature in your article? What appealed to you about those stories in particular, um, and why did you choose to highlight them? Um, again, and you start us off. Okay, sure. Well, I think uh, people started to get a little aware that something was cooking in Mississippi um, in probably, you know, about five, five-ish, six years ago. Uh, there was a big law that was passed um, by the then governor in 2013, a big literacy act. So we knew there had been effort to clean up, to do something different around literacy. And then scores started coming out that showed dramatic improvement for kids, particularly kids, um, uh, black students in Mississippi, their students living in, in poverty, real socioeconomic disadvantage, were, were starting to really do well on the tests that would give us signals about what's happening in classrooms. So I think I was particularly intrigued by this because it's such an intractable, sticky issue in so many places. They cannot get people to a consensus that yes, there is the correct way to teach reading, and yes, there are things that we can do to change adult practice that have profound impacts on kids. That sounds very simple. It's very complex, often in practice. And I was just really intrigued that Mississippi was like, no, no, after decades, we, we, this is so important for the kids of our state. We, we simply have to take an action, like a moral obligation, that happened to coincide with some pretty incredible leadership, I think, across the state. Mm -hmm. Uh, and some sustained commitment. So that's what really intrigued me about what they were able to do. So there was something surprising about the fact that it was Mississippi of all places right, yes. that did yeah. it. Um, yeah. And then they got all the elements right, it sounds like. Yeah, and they'll often say the leaders in Mississippi, right? Everyone is always like, thank God for Mississippi, because you're always going to do better than Mississippi. Right. And now suddenly Mississippi yeah. is, is sort of showing people, actually, we've accomplished a lot for kids. We've accomplished I, a lot. I love that. Albert, what's the uh, success story you highlighted and why did you pick it? Well, I take a look at Denmark. And the reason why I take a look at Denmark is because several different indices see Denmark as one of the least corrupt and most transparent countries. But when you look back on Denmark about 15, 20 years ago, they were in a situation that's very similar to what we're dealing mm. with now in terms of having these loopholes open and these professions that are able to take advantage of them. And when you look at them about 15 years ago, you fast forward about 10 years ago, they didn't really, or 10 years later, they didn't really try to acknowledge the problem. They kept it going because really they didn't understand their role. And we started seeing these exposés start to be released that highlight the relationship between corrupt politicians and these corporate vehicles that are being used for reasons of secrecy in order to hide money. And what they found was that individuals within Denmark are taking advantage of this as well. So then they realized... Sorry, just pause there for a second. You said there were relationships between politicians in particular and these corrupt entities? Correct. Can you be um, more explicit? What are you talking about? What kind of relationships? In terms of them using these companies that have these secretive components to it in order to move their money across several different countries that they really had no connection to. I see. So they started using these, these different vehicles in order to move their money around. And again, they realized that even though they were ignoring it, or because they were ignoring it rather, different individuals within Denmark were taking advantage of this as well. And they didn't do anything to acknowledge it. So they realized there's a domestic interest here. Mm -hmm. But again, about 15 years ago, they were in the exact situation to what we're dealing with now. And when you take a look at them from 2016, which is when the first major expose, the Panama Papers, released, and they realized they have a problem, seven years down the line, they have one of the stronger, more robust programs out there. And this was going, coming from a situation where they had one that was almost to the point, so like Luster, that it was almost to the point where it was non-existent. Mm -hmm. So to go from zero to the point that they're at right now, where I think they can be referred to as a model for several different countries, not only the United States alone, I think is very impressive. So what made the difference? Why did Denmark, apart from the public embarrassment of having the, their dirty laundry aired in the Pandora Papers, um, what made them decide 
to, um, to make this big, big change? I think it was that, but also there's an organization known as the Financial Action Task Force. Uh -huh. So what they do is they co-op with foreign governments and their private sectors to confront this specific challenge. And when they evaluated their country in 2016, what they found was that Denmark was non-compliant in a number of different vectors that are critical to addressing this specific issue. So you have the issue of the exposés that are, that's highlighting how individuals within Denmark are taking advantage of the mm -hmm. system. And then you have the international watchdog that kind of leads the efforts mm -hmm. when it comes to confronting this specific issue, attacking them at the same time, saying that you're doing nothing to address this specific issue. Right. So both of those are compounding at the same time right. and creating a sense of alertness when it comes to fixing this right. big, big problem, which I think was a big motivator. Now, I understand how if you're a Russian, say, it's a big problem for you if a Russian oligarch hides their money in Denmark or the United States, right? But is it a problem for Denmark to have a Russian or the United States to have a Russian oligarch hiding their money in Denmark or the United States? That is, does it affect the countries that are receiving the money in the same way or in analogous ways or in other important ways than it does the countries that uh, are sending the money here? I think so. The reason being is that you, you have two different factors here to take into consideration. One, they could hold their money, or what they can also do is they can use their money within that specific country, whether we're talking about Denmark or we're talking about the United States, to invest in certain properties or different assets that are meant to be for the individuals or the residents of that specific country, but they use it for themselves. And what they do is, since they have so many financial assets and they are in a much better financial position than your typical people because they're engaging in corruption or they're helping facilitate corruption for different politicians, now they're able to invest much more and they're able to inflate different prices. They're able to basically shift the tax obligations to people that have lower income. And there's a number of So effects. let's pause there, because that's really important. I want you to say a bit more about that. Are you saying that, um, so much corrupt money has flowed into certain markets in the United States that it's caused prices for certain key assets like housing, say, to rise to levels where it's unaffordable for ordinary folks? Correct. Can you give us examples? Yeah, definitely. So New York is one that's seen this issue. Miami as well, Los Angeles. Uh -huh. Because they're able to purchase these properties way above market value, something that your typical U.S. citizen can't do, mm -hmm. they're able to, again, inflate the price much more and they're able to pay it immediately without having to actually finance it or anything like that. They could just purchase it right there on the spot compared to your typical resident that has to take out a mortgage or something to that extent mm -hmm. and they have to pay it off little by little. And because of this, real estate agents or different actors that are involved with the purchasing process, they find it more ideal for them to basically have it purchased right there on the spot rather than something that is more long term. So little by little it inflates the price. And you said there's an impact on taxes and it somehow Correct. makes taxes less equitable as well. How does that Correct. play out? So there's certain carve outs that are basically developed by states that they are beneficial to the individuals that are hiding money. And meaning that there's certain arrangements that you can open within a country or within a state I should mm -hmm. say that basically they remove or they eradicate certain tax obligations that are ordinary or you typically see in other states. So when it comes to having to deposit these funds, you could basically hide it or you could basically place these assets in something called a trust arrangement. And what it does is even though those are your assets, because you have it in a legally binding contract with a trust arrangement, technically they're not yours, even though they come from you and you can deposit them to yourselves at a future date. But being that it's in this limbo that no one technically owns it, mm -hmm then you can't really tax them. Interesting. Um, I want to come back to this, but I, I don't want to leave Anna out of the conversation. So as you point out, and we've covered already, mm -hmm. um, many American states have big problems with teaching reading. Yep. Um, and uh, Mississippi um, had problems for a long time before it started uh, moving in 2013. What happened in 2013 um, such that the leadership finally said, enough is enough? Um, we're going to start really dealing with this problem in an effective way that we never have before. Because this is, you know, this is a question I think about a lot in countries that are struggling with um, uh, big problems or states um, where the, um, the policy solutions are not necessarily um, uh, unknown, right? right. And yet, they, for whatever reason, the, um, the government doesn't take action. And as you yourself point out in your piece, it takes a lot to 
change big bureaucracies. It's really, really hard. Most politicians choose not to do it. So what, what was the sort of the spur, the goad, that finally got Mississippi to start moving in 2013? Um, yes, it's such a good question. I think it's a it's it's an example of the importance of leadership. That sometimes can mm -hmm. sound like a cop out because you're like, of course we need leadership. But Governor uh, Phil Bryan, who was the governor at the time, mm -hmm. he wanted to go into their legislative session with a strong education agenda, literacy being a big piece of it. Mm -hmm. He himself was uh, is dyslexic and had repeated third grade. A teacher had intervened with him to repeat third grade because they knew he needed mm -hmm. to. He needed additional support. He was a smart kid, mm -hmm. but his reading challenge um, was holding him back. That was a profound impact on his life. So you can tell he had a personal resonance with this mm -hmm. issue. At the same time, he had hired in an, a great um, state chief, a woman named Dr. Carrie Wright, to lead the Mississippi State Department of Education. Mm -hmm. She had someone named Dr. Kimiana Burke, who ran the literacy team, um, uh, who really helped take this law that was passed in 2013 and put it into action. They had a supportive state board of education. There was a lot of collaboration between the governor, the state chief, and the state legislature on making sure this law happened and that the regulations were written in a way that could be implemented. And that included a really sophisticated layering of accountability for change, accountability for the adults to do something differently, mm -hmm. and support so that the adults understood what to do differently. And that piece, um, that second piece, I think is really, really critical. One of the issues around reading is that there are many educators who have not been trained in the research-based way to teach reading. Um, and so they think they're doing the right thing. Not all, we're all professionals. If somebody came in and said, so Tepperman, you know what, mm -hmm. you, you actually are not doing a research-based way of writing and editing, and what you've been doing is crap and is actually harmful to your audience. You'd probably be like, what are you talking about? I get right? that all the time. <laughs> right, but like, that's the place we put educators who we hadn't actually given them the right training and support to understand this issue and, and implement it in <coughs> classrooms and campuses. And so that's a big cornerstone of what Mississippi did as part of their support was making sure that educators in the state understood this issue and understood what to do differently. Um, and that included things like uh, the- uh, Keep talking. I will keep talking, I will keep talking. Uh, uh, training for, the, not just for sitting educators, but a real focus on how are they preparing educators in Mississippi, so folks who are graduating from colleges of education, ready to go into teaching. <coughs> to make sure that they have the right reading instruction as part of their preparation. Those things sound very simple, but we're misaligned. And when that happens, you're, you're, you're going to be constantly sort of shooting yourself in the foot, right. trying to make sure that people know what to do differently. Um, and I think that's, that's an exciting part of what they were doing. Mississippi's law also included reading coaches that were embedded in campuses, working shoulder to shoulder with teachers and principals in some of the lowest right. performing schools. So it's less of, oh, hey, come to this meeting learn about the research way to teach reading, here's some new curriculum for you, and sort of let them figure it out. It was real working together with educators to understand this difference and how to implement it for kids. Interesting. Yeah. Now there's one other aspect of Mississippi's reform which I wanna ask you about, but I'm yeah. gonna to get to it in a roundabout way. Sure. So I've spent a lot of the latter part of my career trying to write and explore these kinds of success stories because I think it's very good for um, journalism, um, especially given the mood in the country right now, not to focus on if it bleeds, it leads, and not to um, yeah. contribute to the doom mongering, but to talk about the things that are actually going well, because um, although you wouldn't get it from the papers most days, um, there's a hell of a lot of things that are indeed going well. Yeah. Um, when I look at the stories that I've um, worked on over the years together, I find that they tend to be linked by a few common threads. Um, and I think of these as the three C's, crisis, compromise, and courage. Yep. What I mean is the following. It tends to take extreme circumstances. In other words, things getting really bad, having the wolf at the door to overcome the hurdles that ordinarily block reform. And that's in part because there's nothing like existential peril to concentrate the minds of the people in charge and get them to 
um, contemplate taking measures and working uh, hard in a way that they never would um, or, or wouldn't ordinarily um, under everyday circumstances. So that's crisis. Yep. The second is compromise. Um, as we all know, as, as, as policy wonks, um, in order to make changes in government, which is very, very hard, you need two things. It's not enough to just master the policy, right? To get the ideas right. And we've seen this um, throughout American history where we've had some very smart leaders who understand the problems on an intellectual level, but are not able to make them happen. And that's because they don't understand or are not masters of the second part of the equation, which is the politics, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's a rare leader who's able to master both the policy and the politics. Um, but politics is messy, right? Yep. Successful reforms um, are tricky in all kinds of ways. They typically ignore ideology, right? They involve crossing the aisle, mm -hmm. stealing the best ideas from wherever you can find them and not worrying about um, whether they're left or right or Democrat or Republican. Um, and they also involve pissing off a lot of constituencies, which I'll come back to in a second, um, and ensuring that nobody, no particular interest group gets everything that they want, right? But that everybody gets what they need, right? And often I've come to conclude that um, a general sense of slight disgruntlement is actually a, a sign of a policy success, not a policy failure. Because if any particular group is too happy, that means that other important groups are gonna be unhappy. So this leads me to my third C, which is courage. Making big changes means going up against entrenched interests, and this is what I want you to come to in yeah, your, yeah. your answer. Um, but they're also risky for politicians because they tend not to pay off in the two to four year cycle that most elected politicians in this country live or die by, right? So you have to be betting that, um, or you have to be putting the interests of your people and your your constituency above your own narrow electoral um, interests. So I want you both to describe how those three elements, crisis, courage, and compromise, played out in your stories. And, and since I said I was going to come back to you, let's start with you and yeah, then go to Albert. Yeah. Well, I think the crisis was clear, these, these catastrophic uh, reading scores in Mississippi and the understanding how that was creating uh, you know, generational disenfranchisement. You can, you simply cannot succeed as a state when you've got young people who who are not able to read and access information and opportunity. I think um, the compromise that is so distinctive about Mississippi uh, is the sustained commitment that they made to this. Right, it is hard to do this over ten plus years and take the time to do it. So the, the bill did not call for a blowing up of everything that has existed in 2013. There was obviously very significant differences in charges, but they were done with a real infusion of support, as I, as I mentioned, which mm -hmm. is really critical. So I'll give you an example. They did not blow up colleges of education in Mississippi and say, you guys are terrible, we're gonna stop you, rebuild new ones. But they invited the faculty from those teacher prep programs mm -hmm. into the training that teachers were getting to ensure that they understood what was going on as well. They did sort of a methodical way to bring people in. And you'd see that over and over in the sort of way that policy was implemented. Parents who were resistant around, there's a thing in the, in the Mississippi policy called the third grade gate, where kids have to pass the reading exam at the end of third grade to be promoted to fourth grade. Those are highly controversial. Parents were, um, were really worried about the impacts of that. And the state department took on the um, explaining very carefully what that process would look like. There is a long process. There are individualized plans for kids. It's not something that happens overnight out of the blue for a child um, that really help show why mm -hmm. retention becomes an intervention instead of a repeat of something else. And I think the courage here is 
um, really back to that leadership where people were like, I know not everyone's gonna be excited about this idea, but you had the state chief and Dr. Wright, her literacy director and Dr. Burke mm -hmm. and the governor and other leaders in the ledge and the state board who were willing to stick with this beyond that two to four year cycle, Jonathan, that you were mm -hmm. talking about, because it's really taken in the 10 years or so since that law was passed, including COVID, Mississippi has gone from ranked 49th of all states to 21st, mm -hmm. right? So they have leapfrogged so many states in that time. And the kids living in the highest poverty in Mississippi are outperforming um, kids in higher socioeconomic statuses in other states. I mean, it's really, it's real improvement mm -hmm. for the kids who need it most. Mm -hmm. Um, which is now providing a different sort of momentum um, as they look forward. What about you, Albert? Do you see those three C's in your story? Yeah, definitely. When we talk about a crisis, I, I think we have a crisis within the international community, but when you take that crisis and you apply it to Denmark, now you have a crisis within a crisis because they didn't even have the platform to begin with. So. When it came to this specific solution, they, the question for them then became, how do we fix a problem that the international community is still struggling to figure out, but within ourselves from scratch because we don't have that platform? Mm -hmm. So yes, for them, th there was that crisis on how exactly do we figure this out and move forward? And it, it definitely took some compromise to fix this, um, both on the policy side of things and the pol political side of things. On the policy side of things, I, I think it's generally applicable to all policy reform in the sense that Politicians have to understand that it's never going to be a smooth process. There are going to be some hiccups, there are going to be some inefficiencies, some gaps, and therefore there are chances that tensions are going to rise. So for them, they had to understand with each other within the state of Denmark that they had to understand that even though there are going to be some hiccups along the way, in order to solve this, this specific issue, they had to go step by step in order to eventually get to the point where they're at right now. But on the political side of things, you had actual opposition that were against enhancing transparency within the country because it went against their vested interests as well as their priorities as a political party in order to solve this specific issue. So I wanna, I wanna ask you about that in particular. Um, are there, because it seems uh, like there might be, especially given the history of, of how these um, secrecy laws uh, developed, um, that there are may be good business or investment reasons to have secrecy laws in a country, right? And do we, um, or jurisdictions like the United States that are now contemplating closing those loopholes, do they risk hurting their own business and investment climate by clamping down in the way that you'd like them to? In my opinion, no. Because what ends up happening when you enhance transparency is you cleanse the business integrity of the community. So right now what it suffers from is corruption and bad actors are able to take advantage of this. But in reality, little by little as you oust them because it make, it's very difficult for them to then invest within whatever market we're referring to, mm -hmm. little by little the business environment is now able to run more efficiently. There are no concerns, there are no gaps, there are nothing to worry about. So therefore it becomes a more stable environment. So in the short term, yes, you do lose that, that financial source, but in the long term you strengthen the stability of the economy. Okay. Another question when I think about the applicability of Denmark's reform to the United States is that Denmark's government and the US government are structured very differently. Correct. As you've pointed out, this is a federated system where there are lots of powers reserved for the states that the um, government in Washington, the federal government in Washington cannot um, control. Um, Denmark, by contrast, is a very unitary system. So it's much easier for the capital um, to pass laws that um, are then enforced throughout the country. Um, so what does that mean? Doesn't that create problems when you think about exporting um, something that was done in one system, the unitary, the unitary system, into a much more messy, multi-jurisdictional place like the United States? No, because the way that they handled the situation is much different mm -hmm. than any other individual country would mm -hmm. approach this specific situation. The solutions that they proposed were applied on a macro scale rather than a micro one. So, for example, they, they launched the beneficial ownership registry. That's something that we're starting to see several countries start to implement within their country, which is, suggests that it is an exportable solution. Within the United States, we're set to see our own next year. Mm -hmm. Now, there are going to be some shortcomings, it seems like, but the case remains that it does seem like it's an exportable solution. 
So that point right there, I, I do think that yes, this, is, this can be applied within the United States. When it comes to these non-financial professions that I talk about in the paper, mm -hmm. it's a bit different as well because the way that they approach this specific solution is that they applied regulations on them within a separate bureau other than the treasury. Mm -hmm. And this specific bureau, the Danish Business Authorities, doesn't necessarily have a financial connection, rather it focuses on different business sectors. So by regulating them through them, you basically save the burden for the treasury in the long term. And we have similar agencies and bureaus within the United States. In fact, when we look at the financial market within the United States, five out of the seven regulators are independent agencies or bureaus that have a specific niche focus. I think in the case of the United States, when it comes to these professions that are enabling this sort of behavior, you can create another independent agency or bureau that has a specific focus with these professions that segue into the economy, even though they don't have a direct connection. We have a, uh, and by the way, I'd like to bring in questions from the audience now, so please start sending in your queries online. Um, one of our um, uh, audience members, Jennifer Dolan, thank you very much for this question, um, asks Albert about the role of Congress. Um, is there a move in um, the House or the Senate to try to crack down on in the way that you're advocating? Who are the um, uh, the legislature legislators involved, um, and has there been any movement already? And if it hasn't worked, why hasn't it worked? For example, have they tried to pass bills controlling this before, and what's happened to them? Yeah, um, I, I think the leaders, when it comes to this, we could look at Senator Cardin and Senator Whitehouse, and there's a number of different senators that are taking a look at this specific specific issue and trying to crack down on it. And we have seen different forms of legislation passed through. I mean, the Corporate Transparency Act is one. And we did manage to get it passed. However, again, there are some shortcomings, but little by little, I do see that cleansing itself and becoming an efficient registry that we can refer to when it comes to addressing this specific issue. Now, there are other bills that have been proposed that did not pass the Senate. Now, we, we could take a look at the Enablers Act that tried to focus on this specific issue. Oh, I'm sorry, say that again. What was the name of the legislation? The Enablers. Enablers. Correct. So, and it failed. Correct, it didn't pass the Senate. Why? Because it goes against the concept of free and open markets that we hold in American capitalism. So this is precisely the problem that I was Correct. trying to get at before. Mm -hmm. Won't there be a lot of resistance to any kind of a clampdown by the people who feel that this is not the way capitalism is done in the United States, that we have a very freewheeling system and we should keep it that way? Yeah, th there will be some back and forth on it, but I think little by little we're starting to realize that this is more than just a dirty money issue. Mm -hmm. The reason being is that when we look at the geopolitical state of the world, we're starting to realize that dirty money, especially when you connect it to corruption, can be used for security threats. Mm -hmm. And then dirty money becomes more of a dirty money issue, becomes a threat to international and national security. And politicians are starting to realize that. And little by little, we're starting to see more bipartisan support. And because of that, we're starting to see more courage when it comes to proposing different forms of legislation that intends to focus on this specific issue. So yes, ideally, or typically, we do see a contradiction when it comes to this, because mm -hmm. we, don't have, we don't necessarily see the benefit in this, or historically speaking, but I think little by little, that is changing. Um, we have a question from Mark Joyce for, for you, Anne, and this yeah. gets at the perhaps most controversial and also famous or infamous in, uh, element of the reform in Mississippi, which was the retention rule, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. the, the rule that third graders would not be promoted under what's come to be known as social promotion. Um, they would not be passed on to the next grade if they didn't meet their reading standards. Yep. Um, talk about that a little bit in general. And then to Mark's question, um, you write in the piece that it, um, uh, Mississippi was very careful not to, um, uh, not to allow its, its rule on retention to um, be construed as something punitive, mm -hmm. but rather as something helpful. Um, so um, uh, talk about those two elements. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a really interesting piece of the law and that's always, it's always controversial when a state talks about retention mm -hmm. like that. Um, you and I are parents of third graders, right? So you can imagine what this would look like at home. Mm -hmm. I think what Mississippi did here that makes it so interesting is there is a long ramp to, to retention. So getting into that spot there's lots of early screeners that they're using that would help flag kids that have issues and need interventions sooner, for example, in high quality ways. Um, there are multiple, the kids have multiple chances to take the test. There's 
exemptions and a, and a very clear process for how that actually works. On the flip side of it, for kids who do need to be retained, Mississippi is careful to not say, guess what, you get a double dose of what you had that didn't work the first time, it probably won't work the second time. They really think of retention as intervention and because kids have individualized plans, if you're flagged at that point, those children are getting a different kind of intervention around their specific reading issues in that retained year. One of the interesting things, and I flagged this in, um, in the piece, is there's a study that came out recently showing that the retained kids did not have adverse effects. In fact, in fact, they had stronger outcomes than the kids who were close to the cut score but were, mm -hmm. um, were promoted to fourth grade. So they didn't see an increase in absenteeism, which you might see with kids who are really disengaging or right. troubled so in school. Just to, to clarify that a little bit more. Yeah. What you're getting at is the counter argument that parents typically make, right? Yeah. That the social yeah. harm that kids will suffer from being held back outweighs any educational benefit yeah. that they yeah. might um, uh, incur. And you're saying the data actually shows that's not uh, something we should worry about. Yeah, and it's not, it's not because the way they structured that retention policy and the interventions that kids, kids get. They, uh, Dr. Wright, I've heard her speak about it, and Dr. Burke's the same thing, it, retention as intervention retention as intervention. Mm -hmm. And they, they take that very seriously and, are, and communicate sort of relentlessly right. about what that means. So it's not a punishment for kids. Right. It, I'm not saying it's not hard, right? right? That it's not a hard moment for a child and their, and their family, but I think the outcomes that they're seeing show that this is a really positive thing mm -hmm. to ensure, as we said at the beginning, when they get to fourth grade, they need to be able to read to be successful in all these subjects and all these things in front of them. And if you are a struggling reader, you are gonna struggle in social studies, in science, in math, and all these places, and it's gonna become, school becomes very arduous right. um, and disengaging for a and child. You also say in your piece that Mississippi took great pains to show that this step was not being taken lightly. Can you say a little bit more about that? Yes, yes, I mean, I think the, the all the things that ramp into this, meaning like that uh, the early screeners that were part of the Literacy-Based Promotion Act, so that the that teachers and principals are using high quality screeners early for kids to flag reading issues instead of saying, oh, for a kid in first or second grade, they're gonna get it, right. they'll get it by third grade, it'll be okay, when in fact, no, they're not, and there are things that they could have done earlier for a child to help them get back on track. That kind of thing is happening differently now for children, which makes a big difference. Um, so another one of our attendees who's chosen to rena uh, remain anonymous, which means it's probably um, my mother or another family member um, of one of us, um, asked a really good question that I was thinking about as well, which is the policy recommendations that both of you have highlighted seem to be obviously such good ideas that it raises the question of why haven't other jurisdictions moved in the way that the two you describe have um, uh, to, to enact them? What's yeah. taking them so long? And to the particular question that our anonymous um, uh, viewer asks, have other states implemented lessons learned from Mississippi? There's a lot that are trying. There's about 20 states now that have some sort of law in the books to try to move to a, a science of reading approach, a more research-based approach to reading instruction. The things that I would flag that Mississippi did that often gets mix, missed in this, and it's happening, it's happened in Texas where you'll see pieces of good things that are happening, but not this comprehensive package of accountability and support. So for example, if a state is not taking on how they prepare teachers, in addition to implementing things like better early screening to flag kids that have issues, in addition to increasing high quality instruction and the knowledge of teachers who are sitting in schools, doing that all together, you're gonna to see some success, but you're not gonna see comprehensive success. And there's lots of ways for that to fall apart in implementation. I mean, teachers see changes in approaches and policy a lot. They uh, understandably can be like, you know what, this new idea, I'm just gonna wait this out because there'll be a new principal or a new superintendent at some point and I'm just gonna keep doing what I'm doing in our sort of, we have a lot of disparate leadership across education in this country, and you need policy to make sure this is something that can't get weighted out right. by someone. So there's a classic science fiction movie, a comedy, um, that uh, has a joke that I always think about at moments like this, where the characters are talking about how the world ended, and one of them explains to the other, oh, the head of the teacher's union got <laughs> control of a nuclear weapon. Um, <laughs> 
Tell us about the role of uh, the teachers unions in Mississippi and in more broadly um, in uh, the change that you described. Did they oppose, did they support? And if they opposed, did they come around? Well, I think the, the way to think about this, um, and, and I, am the, I am the child of teachers. I did teach uh, at one, one point, so I, I am, I'm not gonna come up and disparage teachers. No, this. And, nor and should it, you. The, but I think what's important to know is in the way we, teachers have a lot of autonomy actually now in many places. We have local control in our, in our schooling system, right? School boards make a lot of decisions. States have a lot of power. Mm -hmm. Federal government has a little bit in our federal system. States have a lot of power. And then local school boards can have a lot. And teachers, as any professional, right? If they're being told, guess what? You've been doing something wrong. And in fact, it's not just benign wrong, it's been harmful to kids. That's, that's a human reaction to resist that and to being told from a top-down way, you have to make a change. I think what Mississippi did that's so important is this investment in training and coaching. So it's different if the governor or the state chief in Mississippi says you have to do something differently and now you go off and do it and kind of the finger wag approach versus if Albert's my coach and he's spending time with me in my classroom throughout a school year, investing in me, investing in the kids that I'm serving my classroom, helping me understand what to do differently, that's a different feeling, right? And I think Mississippi was really smart in investing in educators in a way that you don't often see in policy. So I wanna come back to the general question for you, Albert, which is are other states following Denmark's lead since this seems to be such a good idea? You mean individual states? Uh, countries, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think little by little, I mean, Denmark, I focus on Denmark within right. this paper, but a lot of it is also in cooperation with the rest of the European Union. Uh -huh. So I think we could look to the European Union to, as a sort of model or reference in terms of other countries that are able to do this, mm -hmm. or enhance their environment to basically enhance transparency. So I, I think the European Union as a whole is doing a very mm -hmm. good job. And I think the Financial Action Task Force also does a very good job at holding other countries accountable. They continuously monitor countries that are non-compliant when it comes to these specific issues. And when it comes to this, it kind of just downgrades their economic integrity. And little by little, it applies more, more pressure because mm -hmm. you continue to evaluate them and see that they aren't necessarily hitting the mark when it comes to addressing this specific issue. So now we're starting to see more and more countries cooperate when it comes to this specific issue. I mean, the UK is also following the lead, Canada as well. A lot of our Western partners are creating these sorts of products and tools that intend to stop illicit finance from entering their specific state. Um, and you've touched on this already, but we have a question from yeah. Rachel Schultz, which is how has Mississippi communicated its reform policy down the chain of command to teachers, the ones actually implementing the new um, policy. You spoke a lot about coaches. It seems like yeah. that's a big part of the um, answer, right? That's part of it. The other thing that I think is fascinating, and this gets to the understanding of politics and just the savviness of leadership, right. is that Dr. Wright, when she led um, the State Department of Education, she made sure that a comms person, a communications person was embedded with the literacy team. And I find that fascinating and something that most people wouldn't allocate resources to. And it shows up over and over and every, every time they talked to the state legislature, every time they issued a press release, every time they were giving talks, it was really clear what was happening and why they were, they were just, they were dogged about mm -hmm. communicating what they were doing and why. An example of how that shows up, and I reference it in the piece, is the, the Literacy-Based Promotion Act Implementation Guide. That sounds incredibly wonky, like it's some sort of boring piece of policy. This is a safe space for Yes, for safe. the, uh, but it is like a beautifully laid out document and rubric about the responsibilities and roles of everybody from the state down to the parents. So if you're a teacher, if you're a principal, if you're a parent, if you're a superintendent, if you're a coach, if you're in the State Department, what is your role and responsibility mm -hmm. in implementing this change? I find that fascinating because it's not something, it makes so much sense, but it's not something you'd often see around that. Um, and I think it's, it's a good grounding document because part of what it does is it helps combat misinformation, mm -hmm. right? In the telephone game about what this policy really is, what it's really requiring us to do, because they had sort of a touchstone to go back to that explained this for all the stakeholders involved, which I just think is a really interesting, savvy right. approach. So because both of your pieces deal with how state in one case, a country in the other, made really, really difficult change against a lot of internal um, opposition, 
in a way that has proved to be extremely successful. Um, I wonder if there we can sort of expand outward, think really big, and discuss for a moment what are the takeaways when it comes to or the sort of universalizable principles uh, or lessons when it comes to how to get really tough stuff done in government. Do you have thoughts on those, either of you? Albert, you want to start, and then Anne, you can wrap up? Yeah, sure. So I think when we apply this universally, I think we are starting to see that shift, and we are starting to see countries kind of accept the understanding that, you know, dirty money is more than dirty money. So when it comes to adopting these solutions or similar marks, I think for one, as the general perception when it comes to the specific issue continues to shift and people start to realize more and more, little by little we're gonna start seeing these solutions come in different forms. So I think as that continues on the trajectory that it's currently going on, even though there is some back and forth, I think as long as that remains put, I think we can continue to see that there is gonna be progress even though it is gonna be a bumpy road along the way. Great, and? I would say the things I would take away from this um, is number one, say clearly there is a right way to do this mm -hmm. and don't equivocate about that, right? And that's what Mississippi's leaders were very clear. There is a right way to teach reading and we're gonna do it. The second thing I think is interesting, they had a sponsorship spine, what I would call it, of people who got behind this effort that would sit up and down kind of that, when you think about an axis of power and decision makers, mm -hmm. they, they were thoughtful about that. And then the third piece is uh, think about how you layer that support and accountability. So there has to be clear accountability mm -hmm. that things will be different, but there also had to be clear support to help people do that different thing. And then finally, they measured progress so they could show what we're doing is making a difference. I always think Dr. Deb Burks, who's one of our fellows, talks about trend lines matter when you think about data. So you measured progress so people could see what you're doing is making a positive difference for kids. And that was a really powerful combination that Mississippi put together. It's fascinating. So I'm very sorry to say that we are just about out of time. Um, I found this a fascinating conversation. I hope you have as well. Um, and I really want to thank our two fantastic guests who I'm so fortunate to have as colleagues here at the Bush Institute, Anne and Albert, for joining us. Um, if you enjoyed the conversation as much as I have and you want to read more, check out the new issue of The Catalyst, um, which is filled with stories like the two that we've just talked about. Again, you can find that at bushcenter.org forward slash catalyst online. And please stay tuned for more great content and more Zoom panels just like this one coming soon. I'm Jonathan Tepperman. Thank you so much for joining us.